Well, the break's over and we're back um, with this narrative. Um, today I want to cover uh, the, uh, the origins of the Roman Empire. But before I do, uh, we need to do some administrative uh, things. Like I put the test up around noon and the test is now up on Unlearn. If you go to contents, um, you'll find it, and when you complete it, um, if under um, assignments, um, I have a rubric a term test, and so you upload it there, but you also send it to my marker, Stephanie, so you, you send it to two places. Um, are there any questions about the term test? It's due on the 1st of March. I just had a quick question about who we email it to. Earlier you, had, earlier you had talked about emailing it to you as well. Do you just want it going to your marker? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, because she will, uh, she will communicate with me. Awesome, thank you. Okay, anything else? 
So you should have the term test. It's accessible now. The next item is the essay and the essay is due on the first. Um, and uh, that too, I, I, I will, um, under assignments, I'll um, uh, put a rubric essay one and you upload it to essay one and you also send it to uh, Stephanie. Questions? Good. Um, so today, uh, the Roman Empire, but before we do, I want to do another um, review question. Or just every lecture, uh, uh, I'm going to um, have a review question. And this one asks you to uh, briefly review the history of Greece from around 1200 to uh, 500. So very briefly, uh, the history begins with Minoa and Mycenae. Um, these uh, were um, uh, kingdoms rule, uh, they were kingdoms, Bronze Age cultures. Um, the, uh, they uh, were clearly the antecedents of classical Greek culture. We know this, uh, the, the language and the religion and even the architecture, uh, which of course they got from the Egyptians, uh, nevertheless was passed on um, to um, uh, Iron Age Greece. Um, we know that they ended um, in some sort of uh, invasion and maybe some natural crisis, an earthquake. Um, the next period is the so-called Dark Age, between 1100 and, I've gone over this material before, it's, I'm repeating it, 1100 to 800 BC, this is the Dark Age. It's formative in the sense that um, the, um, uh, the foundations, the material foundation of life uh, throughout Greece, um, grain, sheep, wine, uh, olive oil, um, a characteristic um, uh, sort of um, basic economy, subsistence economy uh, develops during this period. So too does the city state uh, and the, um, the, um, this, the division in Greece based on the city states originates in these villages that are um, um, completely isolated during the dark age. Um, so they never really achieve um, uh, unity um, until they're conquered by um, Macedon, by Philip and Alexander. In any case, during the Dark Age, um, they were ruled by kings. And then comes the period uh, 800 to 600. Um, this is the, um, the population buildup forces the development of trade and colonization. Um, the warrior aristocracy dominates the society. However, as time goes on, the um, trade and colonization are not enough and class war becomes endemic, as does um, warfare between these states, slavery. And so we come to uh, the period uh, the um, sixth, the period from 600 to 500, the age of tyranny, um, when um, tyrants rule uh, because class war um, uh, forces the city states to turn to a strong man in order to um, prevent society from falling apart. And finally, after 500, uh, in the most commercially developed of the city-states, democracy uh, tends to dominate with, of course, Athens being overwhelmingly the most powerful. And then you could might uh, add some sort of contrast with Sparta. So that would be the answer to that question. I, I want now to turn to the Roman Empire. Now the Roman Empire the Roman Empire was the last of the whole succession of 
uh, last, I should say, and greatest of the succession of empires, which we saw, uh, which marked the history of civilization from about 3000 BC. If you remember, there were the Sumerians, the Akkadians, um, the Neo-Sumerians, the Babylonians, uh, the Hittites and the Kassites. There were the Assyrians, the Neo-Babylonians, the Persians, finally the Hellenistic Empire. Um, and then uh, it all culminates in the Roman Empire. It's a, um, a kind of cycle, and a cycle of empires right through the ancient worlds down to the Roman Empire, which is the last and the greatest of these empires because it unites the whole civilized world of the Middle East and, um, and the West, including now places which are definitely going to become part of Western civilization. England, France, Spain, Italy, uh, not uh, the Low Countries, but not Germany. Germany remains outside of the Roman Empire. Well, um, so um, obviously the Roman Empire, and of course, in terms of uh, Western civilization, uh, the Romans especially, uh, they passed on two things to um, the rise of the West. First of all, Roman law, Roman law, and the Christian religion. So the history of the Roman Empire is very important. So to begin with, um, the Romans claimed that um, Rome was founded in 753 BC, 753 Rome, uh, a tiny, uh, uh, at best, uh, a town uh, came into existence about 753. Um, and it was founded by um, an individual right here, Romulus founded the city of Rome in 753. Uh, he had a brother whose name was Remus. So Romulus and Remus are there at the beginning. And in a way, it's a, a very similar story to the story in the Bible, Cain and Abel, because Romulus killed Remus at the beginning of the history of Rome was this fratricide these two brothers became rivals and one killed the other. So there's Romulus. Now, the story goes, the Romans tell the story that um, the two brothers were orphans and uh, they had no mother. And so they survived because a good hearted wolf took it into her heart to uh, basically um, suckle these two brothers. That's how the founding brothers of the um, uh, of Rome survive. A wolf sucks. Now this story um, is um, uh, um, is in a way a kind of myth, which signifies the fact that, in fact, uh, behind the Romans, before the Romans in northern Italy, there was another people who originated in the Bronze Age and became dominant in Northern Italy, we call the Etruscans, the Etruscans. And one of their chief symbols was in fact a wolf. And it does signify the fact that um, Roman culture, Roman society sort of emerges out of this background of Etruscan rule over them. They were, the Etruscans were a Bronze Age people who learned how to, the, around about a thousand BC, they learned how to um, uh, 
uh, use iron. They, they became an Iron Age people. They never achieved political unity. They were divided, uh, but they tended to dominate the other peoples in Italy. Uh, now, the, in central Italy, the the, uh, the major group in in um, in uh, central Italy was and were the Latins, Latin people, the Latins, they spoke Latin. And uh, one of them were the Romans, one of these people were, uh, there were a number of uh, sort of um, Latin um, cities. Uh, ultimately, the most important one of them turned out to be Rome, city of Rome. Um, now, the Etruscans, they were literate, they had an alphabet, um, and they got their alphabet from the Greeks. Because uh, as we saw when we were discussing the development of Greece, the Greeks spread their colonies all over the Mediterranean. They had a, a substantial number of colonies in Italy. Uh, they used an alphabet and the Etruscans took over um, uh, the Greek alphabet to express their language. Of course, their language was different, but they adopted the alphabet from uh, the Greeks. Um, um, now, um, the, um, at the end of the sixth century BC, the Romans were still under the rule of the uh, Etruscans. In fact, there was a king of Rome at that time, his name was Tarquin, doesn't really matter, uh, Tarquin the Etruscan, and the Romans uh, overthrew him. Uh, they over, there was a revolt of the Romans. At the end of the sixth century BC, they overthrew the monarchy and they established a republic. And so this is the foundation of the Roman Republic. Very important because it was going to last 500 years, the Roman Republic. Now we can say in terms of the Etruscans, by the way, you could see uh, the, the word Etruscan, which is, um, which you can see in a way survives in the word Tuscany, Tuscany, Etruscan, Tuscan, um, and this, the focal point of Etruscan culture was Tuscany, where Florence is right now, in Tuscany. Of course, Rome is further south, um, in uh, the very center of Italy, whereas uh, Tuscany is to the north and northwest, where Florence is found. In any case, from the Etruscans, they learned uh, uh, their military organization. The legions seem to, uh, the, the, uh, the, the legion formation of the infantry and phal phalanxes and so on seems to have come from the Etruscans. Uh, the Etruscans liked gladiatorial contests. They liked to see two fighters fight to the death as gladiators. Um, when they won victories, uh, there would be civic triumphs. The victorious army would march back into the city in a triumph, uh, which is carried over by the Ronin. The, Omen, the Romans learned how to read auguries from the Etruscan. Auguries are the study of the movements of birds uh, because the Etruscans and then the Romans believe through the, through the movement and the flights of birds, you could foretell the future. So they, the Romans practiced augury and they got that from the Etruscans. And moreover, there are thing, uh, things in the Roman language, words like lasagna, blood, um, uh, letters, these all uh, these are examples of words that are derived from the Etruscan. At the same time, while clearly uh, founded on um, 
Etruscan culture, um, uh, the Romans also learned a lot from the Greeks. The Greeks were their neighbors. There were Greek city-states in Southern Italy and Sicily. And so the Romans, and they were traitors. The Romans were in contact and so they picked up a lot um, from uh, the Greeks as well. Uh, now, um, as I explained, the overthrow of the last uh, Etruscan king saw the founding of the Roman Republic. And the Romans were, uh, uh, were extremely attached to the freedom that they had gained by declaring themselves to be a republic. They were self-governing. They were not under a king. Um, uh, and this uh, um, establishment of the Republic was uh, this, this second founding of Rome, politically extremely important. It's the equivalent of the Declaration of Independence of the United States, a similar act. Um, and the Romans were extremely attached to the um, what they considered to be the um, polit the constitutional order founded by the uh, by the early Roman Republic. They had the same mentality as the Americans, the founding fathers. The Declaration of Independence, the, U the Constitution of the United States, these are the documents of uh, the American Republic. And the Romans had the same sense that, uh, oh, we must always conform to the Founding Fathers and what the Founding Fathers would have wanted. Now, this is a very, this is a conservative attitude and is still very current among well, uh, most Americans uh, have a certain respect for this. Of course, some people carry this, they're fundamentalists. I mean, we have um, lawyers, Supreme Court justices who believe you cannot deviate from the US Constitution, which was written over 200 years ago. Uh, the, the, this kind of attitude, extremely conservative. Well, the Romans were deeply conservative, uh, the, uh, I should say, the people who controlled Rome, the people who controlled the Roman Republic were a landed aristocracy, a landed aristocracy um, from the start to the finish of the Roman Republic dominated the politics of the Roman Republic. This was a conservative Republic. Democracy to these people was uh, absolutely um, would, men, would mean the end of the world. And you'll see attempts on the part of the common people to establish democracy uh, were suppressed by, this is the story of the Roman Republic. Uh, attempts to democratize were always suppressed by the, by the uh, conservative landed aristocracy who had an institution called the Senate the Roman Senate, uh, by the time you get to uh, the first century BC, there are a hundred senators uh, who are basically part of this Roman aristocracy and they have the dominant political power and are very unwilling to share it. Nevertheless, despite that, the fact is that the common people, um, now we're talking about class war, uh, wouldn't have it, wouldn't accept um, the unlimited rule of the Senate. This is the conflict we saw in Greece as well. The landed aristocracy versus the people in Greece, class war. And the same thing applies in Rome. Throughout the Roman Republic, there is constant class war between the upper class and the lower class. In fact, um, uh, what we can say is um, that the class war um, was uh, the dynamic element. It's the thing that made the Roman Republic uh, evolve, develop. Uh, it was the motor. 
And the same thing is true in Greece. Class war was the basis of the development of, of, uh, of uh, Greece from the time of the 800 BC until Alexander. And the same thing is true of um, the Roman Empire from its beginnings until the fall of the Republic in the first century BC. Now, the common people resisted and therefore um, there had to be some way in terms of organizing the politics uh, where uh, the common people would have some share. And so the common people had their popular assembly. The upper house and the Daman house was the Senate filled with these landed aristocrats. The popular assembly, these were the common people. So there was a popular assembly which shared power with, um, the, um, with the Senate. And um, what we can call uh, this compromise, there was also another um, feature. Another way that the common people were able to express themselves aside from the popular assembly was they had what they call popular tribunes, spokesmen of the people who would speak to the Senate in behalf of the common people. They would represent, there normally were two of them, and they would get up and say what the popular assembly wanted. They would go to the Senate and say, you can't just take all the land or increase your rents. The people demand. And so the tribunes would make these demands on the Senate. So as things progressed, I'm saying that there was constant class war, but at the same time, there were uh, efforts to conciliate. And therefore, you have the slogan of the Roman Republic, which is engraved on all their coins and all their buildings. And the slogan of the Ro Ro Roman Republic is uh, SPQR, which uh, here it is, SPQR, which equals the Senate and people, because quay means and, so the Senate and people, uh, the, the Roman Senate and people, the uh, Romanus. Here, let me. Uh, Senatus populum, populum quay Romanus, SPQR. So this is, uh, this was on their, their standard, their battle standard. This was on their coins. This was on all public buildings, SPQR, the Senate and people of Rome. So the Senate is dominated by the landed aristocracy. The people have their popular assembly. The people have their tribunes. There is conflict, but at the same time, uh, there's a conciliation within the constitution, SPQR. Um, the Senate and people of Rome. Now, um, um, as I said, uh, the class war um, uh, continues, um, but, um, and I want to now, and this is uh, quite important, I want to explain on the one hand, there's this attempt at conciliation, but I'm saying at the other hand, there is the reality of class war. And so a certain dynamic began to develop uh, in Rome, which explains their expansion. It, it explains the, 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 uh, the, the Romans starting from a, uh, a small town expand and ultimately they engulf all of Italy, they engulf the whole of the Mediterranean and the Middle East. In, into a great empire. And there's a certain dynamic behind that. And I want to explain what was going on. Um, so the first I've already mentioned, that is to say um, the conflict between the aristocrats or they were called the patricians or the aristocrats and the people, the plebs. 
Uh, that's number one. This is going on all the time. Um, sometimes they conciliate, but so other times they're in open conflict. Um, the second um, element is um, the compromise. How did they compromise? Well, basically the conflict between the upper class and the lower class was about the land. Um, the landlords control the land. The, the landlords could raise the rent. The landlords could use, as they did, use force to kick the, try to kick the peasants off the land. And the peasants were uh, fighting back. So the ultimate way that which you could um, achieve some sort of class consensus or reconciliation was by grabbing new land. Now this is a this is a key point. Um, the expansion of the Romans, the conquest of new land, was a way in which they could overcome the class conflict between the upper and lower class by simply grabbing a new land, some of which went to the landlords, but a lot of it went to the peasants, and that would satisfy the peasants and cause the uh, both classes could agree. Yes, let's go fight using our legions, we'll conquer new land and we'll get these lands and we will be able to, my cat is in back of me, um, we will be able to, um, uh, we will be able to, um, 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 everybody will have a piece of the action and we'll stop fighting one another. So this, So the first thing is the class conflict and then imperialism, expansion and conquest of new places, imperialism is the way they temporarily found a solution. But of course, the solution would only be temporary because uh, this, these conflicts would redevelop and they would have to expand again and again and again. This is the momentum driving um, their uh, expansion. Now, the third element is the fact that with this expansion, uh, you have two things. You have, first of all, um, the conquests, um, the creation of new lands stimulates the market economy, the commercial economy. But it also enables, uh, when the Romans conquered places, they, in, they either killed people or they enslaved them, just like the Greeks. So the development of a market economy in which slaves were one of the chief commodities. Uh, slavery became more and more important, just as it did this constant warfare, enslavement, and slaves become more and more um, a um, important factor, more important commodity in the marketplace, and indeed in the economy. So let me repeat that. Class war, ex conquest of new land, um, market economy and slavery, uh, feeding back and into the economy as becoming more and more important. Uh, indeed, slavery became more and more important because with this, uh, the, the unruliness of the peasants, the landlords couldn't control the peasants that well. They needed slaves uh, to uh, exploit the land that they controlled. They needed slaves as an alternative to the peasants. So there you go. Uh, now, um, despite all this, uh, by the beginning of the fourth century, uh, by the, the beginning of the third century, the Romans had conquered all of Italy, as you'll see. They had expanded in this way with this dynamic and took over all of Italy, conquered all the other city-states. Um, as we'll see. Um, uh, but nevertheless, as a matter of fact, the class conflict only got worse. And between the fourth and second century BC, uh, there were terrible conflicts between the patricians and the plebes all over Italy. The class conflict that um, was most marked in Rome uh, was uh, prevalent all over Italy between the fourth and second century uh, BC. Uh, now, in the course of this struggle, uh, the 
common people, the plebeians, did win a number of victories. They did, uh, the Senate was, and the aristocrats were forced to make certain concessions. Uh, some of these were symbolic, but uh, it's important to register them, to note that the democratic element in the constitution did make some, some gains. For example, the executive in the Roman state was the, the, the two chief executives were the councils. There were two chief executives, councils. Well, in 366, the common people forced the Senate to pass a law which named uh, one of the councils had to come from the plebeian class. It could not become, come from the patricians. So they gained one of the executive uh, of the chief executive officers uh, became um, came from the plebeian class, and then again in 287 there was a terrible conflict, and in theory the Senate admitted that the common people were the ultimate the popular assembly was the ultimate source of sovereignty. It was a symbolic concession because in practice. Um, the Senate continued to rule. I'll explain that in uh, a few minutes. But at least in theory, the democracy, the common people had forced the senators to acknowledge that the popular assembly was the ultimate source of sovereignty in the Italian state. Um, finally, um, they also, uh, the last thing is that the tribunes who represented the people were given more authority within the Roman government over time. They did gain a certain more authority. So there were these concessions. But um, the fact of the matter is that as Rome expanded, as Rome expanded, the Senate, which was ultimately made up of 100 senators, was a close knit body. Uh, the senators lived in Rome and always attended the Senate. Whereas the patricians, sorry, the plebeians, the plebeians in the popular assembly, they came from all over I Italy and uh, they couldn't uh, make it to the popular assembly. They had to plow the fields. They were occupied economically. And uh, in practice, um, this concession of popular sovereignty um, was uh, more symbolic than real. The Senate continued to be the dominant element in the Constitution. Um, meanwhile, um, as things continued from the fourth through the, uh, the second century, Rome set out on the, um, uh, the uh, course of, co of conquest. As I said, they took over all of Italy. Um, uh, then in the third and second century, they took over the whole of the Western Mediterranean. I'm going to unfold this. I'm going to um, uh, narrate this. Um, and then finally, of course, they swallowed the entire um, civilized world in this part of the world of course, there was China and so on in India, but we're not talking about them. Um, they swallowed the, the Middle East as well. So uh, the Roman Empire it begins in Italy, it expands to the Western Mediterranean, and ultimately then they take over the whole of the, um, the civilized world. So at the end of the um, um, uh, fourth century, uh, by the end of the fourth century, they conquer all Italy. The last holdouts were people in the south of Italy known as the Samnite, and they, the Romans conducted a, a brutal war against these uh, uh, resistors. Uh, but um, what, the way the Romans ruled uh, their, what they called their Italian allies was in the following. Um, they, they conceded the, uh, self-government, that is to say, 
the various city-states um, in Italy were allowed to, uh, which were not directly in Roman territory, were allowed to continue uh, their self-government. But as a matter of fact, the, um, the governing class in all of these towns basically were puppets of the Romans. They made sure that the people who were governing each of these city-states was a friend of Rome. You could not become um, a governor in any of these city-states. And generally, they came from the upper class. Um, and if there was any trouble in any of these city-states, the Roman legion would take care of it. They would send in order to back up these, uh, um, these rich people, these oligarchs, the Romans would use the, their army to basically make sure that uh, uh, the governments in these city-states were friendly to Rome. Um, furthermore, when Rome declared war anywhere, um, the, the allies had to support the foreign policy of the Roman state. Uh, they had no independent foreign policy. They had to follow the Romans. And in fact, if there was a war that lasted any length of time, the Romans would uh, call upon their allies to send auxiliary troops, allied troops, to support the Roman legions. So you can see that there was a kind of nominal independence, but the reality was uh, that these... Um, Italian allies were controlled by the Romans. Furthermore, the Romans said that um, if people from these different city-states in Italy moved to Rome, they could become citizens of the Roman state. They were offered Roman citizenship. Um, now, I just want to spend a couple of minutes describing the Roman army, because it's important. Now, of course, the the patricians, uh, the generals, the officers in the army were aristocrats um, in uh, the Roman um, army. Um, but the mass base of the army, which grew to uh, maybe between four and 500,000 men, was made up of peasants, peasants, uh, um, were the base of the Roman legions. These people who had their own, they had their own land or they paid rent to landlords. Um, they were obliged as citizens of the Roman state to remember the connection in antiquity between military service and citizenship. All citizens had to, all male citizens had to serve in the army. And the enlistments, you had to serve a long time if you were in the infantry, you served 16 years as a legionnaire. You had to leave your, your family, you had to leave your, your land and serve for 16 years, the best years of your life in the legion. And uh, if you were a cavalry man, it was 10 years, but this was an, an enormous burden. Nevertheless, um, uh, the Romans um, imposed this uh, basically, uh, this draft on the common people. And um, uh, meanwhile, the army was organized in legions. Uh, the main arm, there was cavalry, but the main arm were, were the Roman infantry who fought with pikes and swords. And they were invincible uh, for the most part. The Carthaginians put up quite a fight, but at the end of the day, the uh, the, the reputation of the Romans preceded them. They were um, uh, extremely powerful, just like the Greeks had been under Alexander and, their, and his successors, the Roman legions um, had become a legend in terms of uh, military power. And as I said before, by the end of the fourth century, they had conquered uh, the whole of Italy. And you'd think that would be enough, but no. Um, because uh, no sooner did the wars end um, in Italy than a whole new a new round of uh, war began 
with the outbreak of wars against Carthage. And we call these wars the, the Carthaginian Wars. Let me set this up. And here I list them. There were three great wars against the Carthaginians. Um, how can I get rid of this? Yes, this map uh, basically uh, gives you, uh, it, uh, it, uh, des it describes the um, terrain of the Carthaginian Wars, or as they're sometimes called the Punic Wars, because um, as a matter of fact, their enemy, the capital, here is Rome up here. Well, um, the um, uh, the, Car uh, the Carthaginians came from Carthage, which is in Tunisia, on the coast of North Africa, right here. And as a matter of fact, the Carthaginians uh, were merchants. Uh, they were a great merchant people because Carthage had originated out of um, Phoenicia. And ultimately, uh, the, the people, they derived from the Philistines. The Philistines, the Phoenicians, these great trading people, they spread like the Greeks. Where the Greeks did not find uh, found city-states, the Phoenicians did. All through the Mediterranean, they were rivals. The Phoenicians versus the, um, the um, um, the Greeks, and um, the ultimately the the most important city became the city of Carthage, which was the most prosperous, the largest, and so and they became a political power, and they had many colonies. You can see in Italy, uh, sorry, in Spain, um, they had all kinds of colonies in Spain, and um, likewise you see. Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, it's all Carthaginian territory. And they had territories further east into what is now um, um, Libya and so on. So um, the Carthaginians were formidable and they were a maritime people. Um, in any case, um, the, um, the, um, by the end of the fourth century, the Romans had taken over all of Italy and the Carthaginians, you could see where their power lay and clearly a rivalry developed. And in particular, the ambitions of the Carthaginians um, in Southern Italy and in Spain attracted the enemy, enmity of the, of the Roman Senate and as a result, war broke out between 264 and 241, the first Punic or Carthaginian War, 264 to 241. Now, the Romans at first had a bad time of it. In particular, they had a bad time because the Carth Carthaginians were expert sailors, and Rome was a land power. They did not know how to fight at sea. And time after time, the um, Carthaginians defeated them. However, um, defeat is a learning process. And ultimately, um, the, um, the Romans were able to develop a navy. And they ultimately defeated the Carthaginians and took over uh, Corsica and Sardinia, as well as Sicily. So you can see the whole of present day Italy, Corsica is of course part of France, but Sardinia and Sicily and Corsica 
all became uh, part of this budding Roman Empire as a result of the First Punic War. Uh, but of course, the Carthaginians were furious at what had happened to them and determined on revenge. And in particular, they began to intrigue in Spain. The most of Spain was inhabited by the South, but um, the Carthaginians were intriguing in Spain and the Romans um, who were, by this time, they were very cocky and uh, ready for a fight. In any case, the second war breaks out between 218 and 201. Um, and um, as I say, the first arena of conflict is Spain here. Uh, they're fighting in Spain. Well, um, because the Carthaginians consolidate control here and their general, their general, I'm looking, yes, their great general, Hannibal takes command. And what Hannibal does is amazing because what he does is he, from Spain, he launches a huge army uh, headed by war elephants. And you can see the route of Hannibal here from Southern Spain. This army ma marches through Southern France and crosses the Alps and takes the Romans by surprise. And in two great battles, Trasimene and Cannae, Hannibal decimates the Roman army and the whole of Italy is open to Carthaginian conquest. The Romans, the senators are terrified. Uh, the uh, Southern part of Italy rebels against Roman rule. They say, Viva the Carthaginians. They go over to the Carthaginians. The Romans are desperate. Uh, the, uh, the armies of the Carthaginians under Hannibal are marching on Rome. And it looks as though the days of the Roman Republic are numbered. Uh, how this ended, uh, you will learn in the next class.